Good day to everybody. It is indeed a privilege and an honor for me to be in conversation with Mr. Damodaran. And what makes it even more interesting is that I get to ask the questions this time. To encapsulate a rich and varied career that Mr. Damodaran has had is virtually impossible. We're talking about a professional who has worked with union and state governments, with regulatory bodies, with financial institutions, banks, and the private sector, before demitting office in 2008 as chairman of SEBI. His turnaround of UTI at a time when UTI was floundering is legendary. He was also the youngest ever chief secretary of a state when he was appointed chief secretary of Tripura. What is perhaps less well known is the fact that he was only 14 and a half years when he, when he finished school with a gold medal and entered IIT Madras. After two and a half years of being a student of engineering, he decided that engineering was not going to be what he did for the rest of his life. And the world of economics and the world of law saw a student who again graduated with distinction from Madras University for his degree in economics and Delhi University for his degree in law. Mr. Damodaran, it's wonderful to be welcoming you for a change to this program, which is really enabled by excellence enablers, something that you are the founder of. Thank you. Thank you, Vinita. I think uh, you have tried and captured in a few sentences what is often called a checkered career. And I don't know whether a checkered career, the checkered means something good or bad. No, I, I would rather use the words eclectic, okay. um, you know, wide, uh, comprehensive, um, you know, rather than checkered. But more on that as we, as we go along. So, you know, there's so much to talk to you about, but let me start with a general question. Um, you've spent so many years not just creating the pathway, but also navigating this whole road of governance. What are some of the big changes that you have seen in the corporate governance landscape in India, let's say over the last 20 to 25 years? I would like to imagine that long before regulations and law, some companies practiced the value-based uh, systems that we today call corporate governance. But it was with Clause 49 of the listing agreement that corporate governance got some kind of a formal, let's say, entry into the legal landscape. That was the first time that expectations on corporates were set out in regulations. In the early days, uh, many persons complied in letter, not in spirit. Some others just didn't comply and said, let's see what happens. From then till now, it's been a journey of progress. A lot of people say there is much to be done, but there'll always be much to be done. The fact is that if you rewind to a few years ago, to maybe 2005, and then, uh, you know, what, what is it? Another, you know, not, not too many years, 16 years down the line. I would imagine that we have some of the best practices in the Indian corporate sector. Uh, does everybody practice that? I can say with a straight face, no. I wish more of them did. But most important is the initial skepticism that governance was just another activity, some kind of diversionary activity, taking away focus from running the business, that's gone. Today, I think people are seeing value in good governance and that I think has been the major change. We are much better off than many countries, including some of the developed countries. But if you look at it on a standalone basis, I think we have a lot even. So let me pick up on what you wrote recently 
in, um, you know, where you talked about some hits, several misses, where a very important point that you made was that it's not about framing new laws and writing new rules. That doesn't lead to good corporate governance. We just need better regulation. Could I ask you to perhaps be a little bit more specific and say, could you share some illustrations or examples of where this regulation can be better rather than more? I think in the securities market space, what we have seen is a practice called give me a problem and I will give you a regulation. Okay. Without looking at whether existing regulations address that particular problem. See, there are three elements that exist side to side in securities market. One is surveillance. To figure out what's going wrong, who is the mischief maker. The second is enforcement. After you find out what is happening. And preceding enforcement is investigation. So you get information, you investigate, you believe you have enough material to throw the book at the offender. And then you go in for enforcement. It doesn't mean that every time something goes wrong, you write a new regulation. I'll give you one example. After Satyam uh, blew up mm -hmm. early 2009, there were lots of persons, including in corporate India, who said we need new regulations to address this. Forgetting that existing regulations addressed it. The gentleman just took liberties with the regulations and with law. Got caught. Of course, on his own admission, he got caught. And then uh, yesterday only I came to know that the process is still on to finally bring him to justice. And ours is a very tortuous judicial process. But the point is that do we need new regulations in that context? We don't need new regulations in that context. There are several elements. There are several. Let's say there is a problem with IPOs. What do you do? You promptly revisit all the regulations regarding IPOs. Tweak a little bit here. Maybe the change is not substantive, but then what you have, what you are letting loose is regulation. And sometimes you don't need regulation. I'll give you two examples. One, the settlement system, which is in SEBI now. The settlement system, which was introduced in my time, because we wanted to clear the uh, large number of minor cases so that the available bandwidth can be used for the systemically important. Mm -hmm. But there was no regulatory backing for that. There was no regulation written. All that came much later. He introduced that. It was challenged. It, it survived the challenge. Another example is that in what was famously called IPO scam, there are a number of persons got allotments in different names at the same address, etc. Uh, all of that happened, I think, in the early 2000s. Uh, it came to light, the investigation came to light when I was there. So the, the final uh, findings by a colleague of mine. And we decided that if these persons had unjustly enrich themselves, which is what they had done. Mm -hmm. We needed to get that money back. Now, there was no provision in regulation for disgorgement. So we passed orders of disgorgement and got them to cough up the money. It was challenged and the court said, we are not interfering with this. The only thing is that better to put it under a system, under a regulation. So the point I'm making is this. If you want to do good, if you want to be effective, you don't have to wait to write regulations. So what is uh, so what is behind this reaction? So this is very reactive. Something happens, I frame a new regulation, and I believe I've taken care of. I have reacted to what has happened yeah. without taking into account or context the bigger picture. So what is what is causing you know this reaction from the regulator in the first place? And what should the dialogue move to? One of our problems has been, and it continues even as we speak, is that we don't look at issues in a systemic way. We look at them in a transactional way. 
Right. And when we do that, when we have a situation where you address the problem because of a certain episode, mm -hmm. and you go to the extent of writing regulation, keeping that episode in mind, and if there's a slight variation on the same theme, the theme is the same, it's a variation, your regulation is inadequate. Why? Because you got fixated on the specifics of that particular problem. If we don't move away from that, if we don't look at what is systemic and fix it, you will have more issues, more problems, and you will be responding, reacting in a transactional fashion. We need to move to the system. That's important. So, um, if you were, um, you know, if you were advising the regulatory bodies, and I'm not just talking about SEBI here, I'm talking about the collective. Uh, what, is, what are three things that you would urge the regulators to think about before framing, in your words, better regulation? One certainly is a better consultative process. Mm -hmm. You have in the Indian regulatory environment, consultative. Draft regulations are put out for public comment. Even before writing regulations, the content that is proposed to be put in the regulations is put out for public comment. Right. What happens after that, nobody knows. Who commented? What were the comments? Did you consider them? Did you reject them because they didn't measure up? Did you incorporate some of them? Incorporation is easier to see because the finished product will show you the incorporation. Mm -hmm. So is there a sense of satisfaction? In fact, my belief is you should put out a consultation. Get the comments, rewrite your proposal, put it out a second time, and then see whether this passes possible. Absolutely. And if you think everybody won't agree, there will still be people who have problems. But if you think it serves the greatest good of the greatest number, as Jeremy Bentham said, mm -hmm. go ahead and put it in your proposal. That, I think, is the one thing that regulators need to do, a more effective consultative process. And help to that is before you write regulation, you must do something called regulatory impact assessment. We've mm -hmm. talked about it for years. Yes. Within India, outside India, conferences, RIA gets fairly respectable mention, but post the conference, nobody seems to be giving it much attention a good point made and that's it and the life goes on. But every prospective regulation must pass a regulatory impact assessment to see whether it serves the purpose that it is intended to serve. Is there an existing regulation that can address this? Is it a cost-effective regulation that you don't end up burdening the system with cost? And the benefit is not proportional. The RIA is important. I would urge persons to put in place Sunset clauses in all regulations. And the reason I'm saying this is the world is changing. Mm -hmm. The economy has changed. The world has changed. Corporate India has changed. Uh, the way businesses are done. In fact, the nature of business, the kinds of business, everything has changed. Right. So therefore, after reasonable intervals, you don't want to do it too frequently. Maybe after three years, maybe after five years, depending on the specifics of that regulation, you need to revisit. And how can you force a regulator to revisit? Have a sunset clause. If you don't revisit this and either extend it or rewrite a new regulation, then this is over. Your powers cease to exist. And that's the best threat to a regulatory organization. True. The fact that the powers will vanish if you don't do something. The third is something that the Reserve Bank has done more than once, mm -hmm. which is the Regulatory Review Authority. I think every regulator needs to do that. There are several other things that they need to do. Why do people make mistakes? I don't know what the law is. It's written in complex English, right? I want to make an investment proposal. I will end up everything, my money, my physical resources. I know who's going to run this business, etc. But I have a doubt whether what I'm doing is consistent with the regulation. Mm -hmm. Is there a place that I can go to and get a sign off saying, yes, we've gone through what you intend to do and it's all right. So that with a clear conscience and with some confidence, I go ahead and make the investment. That doesn't exist in the securities market. 
what you have is an informal advisory mechanism. And I think the informal says it all. When you actually make the mistake and somebody tells you, sorry, you stepped out of line, that informal advice is no more than a piece of paper. True. So you must give me that confidence. I think these are some of the areas I would look at. And the last one, but certainly not the least important, is capacity building and regulatory. Mm -hmm. You need people with relevant experience, relevant skill sets. The first being that senior people in the regulatory organization must have themselves been in regulated industries. You must know where the shoe pins is. That's important. Sure. You can't come in and make theoretical. The second is that if you have people who have, let's say, a general MBA and bring that person and say, no, I've got MBAs who are doing that. It doesn't work in the securities markets. You need someone with a special kind. Mm -hmm. You need a very large number of lawyers. Because at the end of the day, if you drill down to basics, uh, regulation is about law and accountants. There's no third element. There is no... There must be some psychology, I'm sure. But there's no philosophy or social sciences other than that. Uh, and right regulatory temper. Persons who come into regulatory organizations must have the patience, the ability, and the wisdom mm -hmm. to hear both sides before they arrive at a decision. You shouldn't rush to judge. I think broadly, that is what I will tell them in the unlikely event, if I may divert a little bit, when I first uh, took a flight many, many decades ago. Uh -huh. I think it was in the mid-60s. The announcement used to be in the unlikely event of a fall in cabin pressure. <laughs> yes. Nowadays, they say in the event of a fall in cabin pressure. In all these years, I have witnessed only once a fall in cabin pressure. But the unlikely is gone. So let me use that to say in the unlikely event of they're reaching out to me, this is what I would tell them. Great. I, I do hope some of the regulators get to hear <laughs> this and see this interview because I think some of the comments you've made are, you know, more than anything else, practical and pragmatic and actually, um, you know, spur the cause of better regulation rather than impede it. So staying within, uh, you know, governance, which is really your, um, um, you know, your... Uh, area of expertise, um, I want to move a little bit to some of the work that you are currently doing through Excellence Enablers and which is very much part of the overarching governance framework. And that is talk about board effectiveness. Given your experience of, you know, so many years of looking at board effectiveness as a member of a board, as someone who actually assesses other boards and their practices. <coughs> what are some of the areas you believe require more attention when it comes to better board effectiveness? No, uh, the reason we started out with Excellence Enablers, which is a joint venture of mine and a younger colleague of mine whom you know, mm -hmm. Yanni, we set it up together a few years ago. And the intention was firstly to disabuse so-called good boards of the notion that they are good boards, that they're great board, to show them where they're falling short. And then those that did not see any value at all in having worthwhile boards, who treated boards as, and I've used this expression somewhere, an avoidable nuisance imposed by law. <laughs> uh, so those persons had to be told what value the board can bring to the table. The role clarity, the uh, separation of the roles of the, uh, the board and the management, the nature of the relationship, which I've always believed should be one of constructive tension, not peaceful coexistence. On the Indo-Chinese border several decades ago, we had peaceful coexistence. It doesn't work in board. Uh, you've got to constructively challenge management. Uh, so we looked at how can directors ask the right questions in voting. 
not because of this misguided effort that's going on now to teach them the sections of law and regulation and the provisions. That doesn't make a director. And writing an exam. And writing an exam, passing it, getting on to a data bank with several people who are dying to get into boardrooms. The minute somebody is dying to get into a boardroom, I would be suspicious. Mm -hmm. I would rather have people who are reluctant and have to be coaxed into getting into boardrooms because they are the ones that I value and are not dying to get in there. But there are several people that believe that life is complete only if you have been a board director. So those, those people clearly will take the exam yet into data. Our approach has been look at what a director needs to know in terms of domain because he's not a domain expert. In terms of teamwork, how do you function as a team within the board? How do you summon the courage to ask the tough question? And not get fobbed off by people who've been there longer saying, no, no, we've dealt with this. So you need to stay in there, ask the tough question. How do you see your role as not one of the opposition party in the boardroom if you're an independent director? I will oppose everything that management brings. That way lies safety and no investigating agency can ask me later, why did you agree to this? I wouldn't have agreed to anything. That's my perfect defense case. But before anything happens, the company will come to grief. We can't take decisions and work can't go on. So how do you look at what needs to be done to encourage the management, help the management on occasion, handhold the management, COVID times, for example. Several mm -hmm. managements were really putting out the fire. They were not doing any long-term thinking. You needed somebody to help with that because you couldn't park that. There were opportunities that COVID was throwing up. You couldn't park that. And yet you had managements working 24 by 7 on putting out the fire. Right. So many people falling ill, so many computers to be rushed. What do I do about cybersecurity? All those issues. So I think that is an area that we focused on. Uh, one issue that we address, and that is what I started out with, is boards in denial. Oh, we are a great board. Mm -hmm. And when you talk in terms of board evaluation, oh, why do you need to evaluate this? We are doing a phenomenal job as it is. It is from that denial that every problem starts. If somebody said, okay, we are doing a great job, maybe we can do a great job. And that is where excellence enablers comes in. We try and persuade people, maybe, maybe you need to do something more, something different, something better. And bring best practices from other companies here. Several best practices are sector neutral. They're not mm -hmm. specific. And that's something that we can bring in. Of course, we put in place all manner of safeguards, not limited to uh, an NDA. We have several other safeguards so that we don't... Uh, have the burden of unnecessary knowledge. We only take what we need to know. And I think it's been a very satisfying exercise. Even the training, the evaluation, all of these have been very satisfying interventions. So what is the one suggestion you would make to chairman of boards um, in terms of actually ensuring that the company and the business and the chairperson, of course, is really getting the best out of the talent, the diversity of experience, that the diversity of perspective that different board members bring. I think the chairman's role is very important. It has not been discussed as much in literature on governance as the CEO's role has, as the board's role has. But the chairman is a very, very important functionary in the boardroom because the chairman is the chairman of the board, and the board is the one that sets the agenda for the company, gives the company a sense of direction, supervises the work of management, and this is the person sitting on top of that organization. Clearly, you have expertise in the boardroom. You have diversity of experience in the boardroom. The chairperson's job is to see that all of that is adequately extracted so that the distilled wisdom is what comes out to board decisions and informs management action. Sometimes chairperson sit back and boards you have all kinds of people. You have what I call uh, persons who have 
have to say something. And then there are those who have something to say. So the people who have something to say stay quiet because all the air time is monopolized by the guys who have to say something, especially if the minutes are written in a manner that attribution is there. Oh my God, look at that. 40% is what I said. All the others together had 60%. We don't want to travel down that path. So the chairperson has to expect from the board members, not only in the board meetings. That's a mistake Indian boards make. Absolutely. Board meeting over, bye-bye, see you after three months. Absolutely. No. During that period, reach out to people. This is what is happening. Why don't you interact with so-and-so and help -so them address whatever they have? Because sometimes some members of management, not the KMPs who happen to see you in every meeting, but there are senior management person who don't attend every board meeting. And yet they might think, okay, she's run Britannia, run it so well. She's been on multinationals overseas. Maybe there's something I will gain by just talking to her, not on specifics. Just ask her broad spectrum questions. How did you address changing consumer demand? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, a pharma company is not dealing with changing consumer demand. Every consumer wants products to save his or her life at the end of the day. But to get to how people think, how people decide, after decision making is not rocket science. You can benefit from other people's experience in a tough mm -hmm. situation. What did they do? I think that is the chair's responsibility. Seeing that meetings are conducted well, nobody runs away with the agenda, and that the management gets to know that at the end of the day, the board will call the shots in terms of what the management needs to do, and the management has to do it. You know, you are right. Uh when you said that there isn't much that has been spoken about or written about on the role of chairs, I was reminded of Sir Adrian Cadbury's book, which he wrote in the early 90s, I think, where he talks about chairmanship and the role of the board, where he's very explicit in terms of what is the responsibility of a CEO and what a chair does. Yes. You know, I don't know what you think about it, but I thought it was... No, I, I think there have been a few. Certainly, Sir Adrian Cadbury's book was there. He was, of course, focusing more on the audit committee, which was what had gone wrong, gone wrong in the UK. But the, board, uh, the book yes. dealt with yes, the larger right. issue yes. of boards. And in fact, uh, there are some good publications that have focused on it. But uh, I think less than it has focused on the chief executives and the board as a collective. The uh, other uh, point from what you said, that there is not much written on the chairs, etc. Many people in India certainly think that if you're appointed a chairperson, you hit the ground run. You don't. So they've been on the board for several years, uh, and now they're moving into chair, no, you don't hit the ground run. Because there are not just your colleague directors till the other day who are looking to you to provide the leadership. There are people who are not board members and yet whose value can be extracted by a board if you set the right sense of connection. Uh, but at that age, at that stage in life, many people think they are beyond training, beyond orientation. And it's a brave person who says when you're closing say, between 65 and 70 to say, okay, there's a lot of learning ahead. Um, you know, so we've talked about the role of a chair, overall board effectiveness. Um, so two other related questions. Um, you know, how independent are independent directors? And let me ask my second question so that you could answer both of them uh, together. Uh, and the second really is, what do you see as the increasing role of, let's say, proxy advisors in India? We're seeing... You know, of course, we've seen activist shareholders in the US and UK. They've got CEO changes done. There as the proxy advisors play a far more significant role there as compared with what they do here. So if you would just just share your thoughts on, you know, how independent are independent directors and then the role of proxy advisors as you see it in the Indian context. Uh, Dr. Reddy, when he was in the Reserve Bank of India, 
was asked, is the RBI autonomous? And his answer was one for the ages. The RBI is as autonomous as the government allows it. So the general belief, I don't subscribe to that in the context of independent directors. The general belief is that an independent director is as independent as the promoter or the large shareholder wants him or her to be. I don't subscribe to that. I think today we are lucky that we have not a very large number, but certainly a significant number of directors to whom that position does not mean that much that he or she will, you know, compromise with what they feel comfortable with and then uh, take a position which leaves them unhappy. You know, I think there are several people who will put, put their foot down, they will disagree, they will argue, they will dissuade managements on occasion, maybe even dissent, mm -hmm. which, is not, which for a good reason is certainly a worthwhile, I won't say rush to dissent, but certainly you should dissent if nothing else works and proposal is prima facie, let us say, illegal, mm -hmm. not, not wrong. Commercially, a decision can be right or wrong. Right. It's your judgment versus everyone else's. But if it's flying in the face of legal provisions, then I think a director should, and we have that kind of director, who are able on their own to tell boards and managements, look, don't do this. Mm -hmm. Not good for you. So I think an independent director is as independent as he or she wants to be. The real issue is, does that position in the boardroom matter to you? Mm -hmm. If it matters to you because of what it gives you by way of compensation, and compensation in some boards is good, you surely don't want to walk away in a hurry. But at the same time, do you want to sit there and have this problem inside you I'm not comfortable with what's happening around here. The earlier you opt out of that arrangement, the better it is. So I don't think people today get into boardrooms just because of what it brings them by way of payments. Far from it. There are people who join boards where the payment is minimal and yet they're there and they're enjoying it also because they're able to contribute. But uh, I think ultimately each director will decide whether he or she is independent. No external agency can do that. Maybe in one misguided attempt said, in order to improve the independence of independent directors. And my point to them is simple. You're either independent or you're not. It, it exactly. Is, there is no 50% independent. I said 75% uh, honest, 25% dishonest. You're honest or you're dishonest. Exactly. It's the same thing with independence. I don't think those efforts will take us anywhere. As for proxy advisory firms in India, they have got a little more active in recent times. I think the reports are far more focused. Uh, there are restrictions on how much they can engage with companies before they put out the report. And the timelines are very strict. As it is in India, what happens is that proxy advisory firms have a lot of work around the AGM season. Mm -hmm. And many companies have the regimes around the same time. So they don't get enough time to do a deep dive into various things. Yet they do a reasonable uh, job of what they are tasked to do. The problem with the proxy advisory firm recommendations, not with the firms, is that when they come to a conclusion based on what they know, based on what they found out, and based also on their norms, their certain norms, most institutional investors just go by what they say. Mm -hmm. The reason being, and this is very interesting human psychology. If I am agreeing with a proxy advisory firm when I have paid my subscription to that firm, I don't have to justify anything to anyone. It's like engaging a consultant and uh, acting on the recommendations of the consultant. If I have to disagree, then I have to make out a case within my organization why I am disagreeing. That has to travel two levels up. I have all of two days before voting commences. And therefore, the person who receives this says, do I want to go through all of this? Mm -hmm. I don't think it is such an important item. Let me go with what the proxy advisory firm says. What that sometimes translates to when it has happened in other countries is they move from activism to adventurism. Right. Fine. When you move to adventurism, then you have an issue. 
And that issue is that, you know, then everyone looks in your direction. So what are they likely to say? Someone once told me in the boardroom, the windows must be kept open. Look outside, you can get to know what the proxies are saying. That's a good reason for keeping it closed. Apply your mind for heaven's sake. And assume that if you apply your mind correctly, they will endorse it. Why are you worried up front of what they're going to say? So I think uh, proxies have a good role. Uh, if they have the kind of rigor that is expected of them in the analysis, if there is no conflict of interest, because if there's a conflict of interest in the proxy firm, clearly that would create issues. Uh, SEBI has done something. In fact, the US does not regulate proxy advisory firms because they believe that it's freedom of speech. You can't Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Whereas in India, it has been brought into the fold of analysts. Mm. So that regulation doesn't sit well with the proxy advisory kind of work, and yet you had to locate it somewhere. This was the um, more relevant or the less irrelevant. So you went right. there. Uh, so they're doing they're doing reasonably well. I think. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure we get in two more questions before uh, you know our time comes to a close. Uh, staying with with the board, the role of the board, you know, increasingly we're talking about the contribution of the board in creating a certain kind of corporate culture. And on the other side, I see things like, you know, ESG, which from, you know, next year is going to become mandatory reporting, etc. What do you believe in essence is the role of the board in creating that corporate culture? You know, especially in the context of ESG, where reporting on dimensions that have never really been seriously, um, uh, you know, scrutinized before, uh, will become significant and important. I think it is clear that the board is and has always been the custodian of corporate culture. Because How do boards actually ensure that that role of the custodian is yes. played with responsibility one, and one, with empathy. Yes. One is that the board itself should understand what ESG is. ESG again is not preparing a long questionnaire ticking certain boxes. If you look at the journey in India, we started out with the BRR. We are now moving to the BRSR. Right. Because we have brought in sustainability into BRR, and so it's BRSR. And the BRSR is supposed to point us in the direction of ESG because it looks at all these three constituencies, ES and G. But the method is interesting. It asks some questions to which you respond. Now, it could be that you've done something phenomenal for improving the environment or for improving the, uh, let's say, uh, condition of persons who come in that S space, your stakeholders, your vendors, your employees, your whoever. Or in the governance space where you've done something far more than what law and regulation expect you to do because you believe it is right. Some of these, maybe you can't fit into a questionnaire that is a lowest common denominator kind of but what applies for companies at all levels, it, it won't fit into that. The other thing is if that approach is followed and that alone, you'll get to a situation where many people are experts in ticking boxes, they will tick it. Do you have an audit committee? You have an audit committee, but how long does it meet? What does it discuss? It's never captured the questionnaire. But I can think that box. I have an audit committee, it meets a X number of times a year. Right? Now, if you look at what is happening elsewhere, and I think they have moved on, as far as ESG is concerned, in terms of, especially in the E space, mm -hmm. they have moved on to identify what is required. It is no longer just about carbon footprint or water, about some more trees being grown. It is uh, renewable energy, green effect. It is not just about that. They are looking at what is the objective. There was that ad of uh, an oil company many years ago, which appealed to me, which said, we have not inherited the earth from our father, from our parents, we borrowed it from our children. children. So I think keeping the 
the uh, environment and through the environment, the globe, safe for the next generations. And how does that fit in with what the corporate does? What is the kind of business it does? Now, take one simple example. Movement towards electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. If, if we were environmentally conscious as a country, we would have done it 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But it's now because boxes have to be ticked that we're moving in that direction of moving away from, uh, you know, your conventional gas gas. So I think uh, ESG is important. But if you introduce it too quickly without preparing the groundwork, which I regret hasn't been prepared, You'll end up with, again, box ticking. You'll end up with the concept nobody understands. Everybody will pat themselves on the back saying, we're doing very well in ESG, and yet there'll be nothing to show outside. For example, moving away from E, if you look at the S space, are all your stakeholders happy with what you're doing? Uh, you know, uh, I don't think that somebody says, okay, we're having CSR, we are... Uh, uh, you know, planting so many trees, educating so many children. Have you looked at how many of those trees have survived after one year? Have you looked at how many of those children remain literate after you have taught them for a year? That yeah, follow and also yeah. importantly, you know, how does that become part of your business model? And it's not yes. something yes. that you do standalone. Yes. Saying, so, you know, this is my business, but by the way, to tick off this box, this is what I'm doing. I, yeah, I, I think also excessive prescription, which again is the one thing that shouldn't have happened when we started out on the CSR thing. The whole list of activities came. This you can undertake, this you cannot. Right. right. Instead, if there had been general statements pointing to what you should do or should not do rather than a long list. Now, you can't have religious places constructed under CSR. Excellent. It's very good. In a secular country, you should not have religious places. What happens if I construct a school building and in one portion of that locates the religious place? Mm -hmm. I have smuggled in the religious activity under CSR and nobody's noticed it because <laughs> I'm accounting for it as a school building. A school. So I think uh, the conscience ought to be clear. Impact assessments ought to be meaningful and uh, that, that's not happening adequately, third party impact assessment. ESG is the way to go, but I think the preparation of the ground is important before we start planting the seeds of ESG. So quickly getting into ratings and giving awards. That is the other thing. You know, Once you have ratings, then you rush into awards. And even before determining what are the right metrics. Absolutely. Anyway, yes. that's that's a separate conversation. Uh, there's a separate topic for a full-blown conversation. Lastly, I do want to end with one question. And that is that if today's Mr. Damodran was called upon to give advice to Damodran who was 40 years old, what would today's Mr. Damodran Tell that 40-year-old Damodaran then. The thing with most people who have the name Damodaran is they're born old. So, so they don't age. No, you will not get away with that answer. <laughs> no, I'm not <laughs> trying to get away. Not, not for a moment. Uh, I think, you know, some of it might not be relevant. Because it is for somebody who's today 40 years old, maybe to look at what I have done, what you have done, what somebody else has done contextualize that because some of what I did at that time, perhaps in today's context, might not be the right. Might be on a standalone basis, good moves, which are not effective. But I would say this, and this is not just for a 40-year-old, it would be for a 20-year-old, it would be for a 100-year-old if he or she chooses to ask my advice, is you must be happy about the decisions that you take. A, you must do the things that you're happy doing. B, whatever decisions you take, you must be happy about. When I talk to young people, I tell them one thing. Always be happy. Never be content. I know it seems a little difficult to well digest. But you must be happy about who you are, what you have achieved, what you have done. And yet, if you 
stop there. Then you're moving back because everything's relative. The world is moving forward. If you stay still, you move back. Uh, as was famously said in Alice in Wonderland, you have to run fast to stay in the same place. Exactly. So, so even for that. So I think it is important that uh, people are happy doing what they're doing and uh, not give up too soon. Mm -hmm. I must share with you my philosophy of life. It goes back to a game that I did not play, but I've seen my children play when they were young. But many people of our generation also played that game, mm -hmm. which is a game called Treasure Hunt yes. and birth Birthday Parties. Yes. Now, the basic principle of the Treasure Hunt is that there is a treasure. You start with that. There is a treasure somewhere. You've got to Absolutely. go and find it. I believe that when God created us, and God is also the creator of problems. Humankind is his best creation. He's challenging us with find, finding solutions to the tough problems that he would not pose to the plants or to the animals. He's posing those to us. But he's not cruel. So God is not cruel. God is kind. And therefore, there must be a solution that is kept somewhere. Our job is to go and find it. So I believe in the treasure hunt theory of life. No matter what your problem, there is a solution, go and find it. The minute you think there's no solution, you lost even before you start. That's a wonderful way of concluding this conversation with you. Thank you very much. You know, we end on that uh, very positive and uh, constructive note from you. Thank you. I could have asked you many more questions, but maybe there will be a sequel. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for putting me on notice. Notice is always. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.